Ladies and gentlemen, it's none other than SF Saeed, dun, 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 dun. author what? of Varjak Poor, the, uh, the Outlaw Varjak Poor, and Phoenix. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for reading my books to everybody out there. Hi, everyone. Oh, well, it is absolute privilege. Um, thank you for giving me the permission to read it and, um, you know, bring it to life. We've had so many who watched the first Varjak Poor and it totally got them hooked. And now they're into the second one as well. That is so brilliant to hear. Um, thank you. Happy reading to everybody out there. Keep the way alive. <laughs> for sure. Um, so, wow, it looks like a really interesting place where you are. Are you in a library? I wish. Um, this is my study at home um, where I'm currently writing my new book. That I'll tell you about a bit later if you want to know. Yes, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I used to write in my local public library. I love libraries. I think they're brilliant, amazing places. Uh, but of course, with, with lockdown, you know, uh, I couldn't do that anymore. So I'm very lucky I have this space at home where all my books live. And, uh, and so this is where I've been working. This is my study. So these are some of my books. There are more that you can't see uh, underneath this table and upstairs and every room in the house is just a bit like this. So wow, <laughs> that is incredible. Well, I think um, obviously that is where you're getting your inspiration from and it must be such a good place to work. Well, you know what? I think every reader can be a writer because every writer is a reader. Every single writer I've ever met, we all live in places like this. We all read a lot. Uh, so if you love reading, that is amazing. Read as much as you can. Uh, and if you are interested in writing, I think just try and write the sort of stories you'd want to read yourselves. That's the best advice I, I could ever give anybody. Um, but what would you like to know? What, what, what would you like to talk about? Right, okay, so um, I've got some questions for you about uh, Varjak Poor books specifically, and I really want to know, do you have cats yourself, or did you have to study cats to find out about their movements or their habits or anything like that? So, yes, I, I have had a couple of cats in my life who have inspired the story of Varjak Poor. Um, there is one of them whose name was Varjak Poor. Uh, this cat was, he was just a little kitten when we first met him, only a few weeks old. So small he could sit in the palm of your hand. No way. Tiny. Yeah, yeah. Very innocent little cat, never been outside in his whole life. The first time he went outside, he goes up to our garden wall, 100 times bigger than he is, before we can stop him, he's coiled up like a spring and exploded and run all the way up the wall till he's sitting on the top. Uh, I recognise that. I recognise that. that the, yeah, absolutely. I want to know what happens next. So I had to sit down and write the story myself. So really? yeah, Harjat Paul was absolutely inspired by my own cat. And I think that's something anybody could do. You know, if you have a pet, you could write a story about them. If you would like to have a pet, you could write a story about the pet you would like to have, you know, write about what you love, what you yourself are interested in and inspired by. So I, I love my cat. I thought his adventures were better than telly. So, uh, you know, I, I used to really enjoy writing this story for well, my own entertainment. And then it, it, it became a book. Well, the book is better than telly, let me tell you that. Um, and also, uh, the, the places that are in the book, I mean, some people have asked me, is it London or is it New York or is it some kind of big city or, you know, Mesopotamia? Is, is that in any way linked to you or your history or where you've travelled? Yeah, so interesting. Well, the first thing to say um, is that I wanted to tell Varjak's story entirely from Varjak's point of view. So we never, ever leave the point of view of this kitten who really knows very, very little about the world. Um, and I'm not sure cats necessarily think of cities as having names like London or New York. I think it's just the city. It's this huge, almost incomprehensible thing. So that's why I didn't specify any places in the book. Uh, also, I would like every reader, wherever they are in the world, to be able to imagine it wherever they want it to be. So if you're in London, it can be London. If you're in New York, it can be New York. If you're in Southampton, it could be Southampton. You know, wherever you want it to be, that's where it is. Having said that, if you want to know what I think, which I, I don't know why you would, because I'm only one other person who's read the book. Once a book is finished, I think it belongs to readers uh, and, and it's for them to really say 
what they imagine in their minds, not for me. But if you want to know what I think, yes, I am a Londoner. Uh, I live in London. I've lived in London for as long as I can remember. So many of the places in the book I imagine as London settings. Um, so there's the pigeon hunting scene, for example. I was going to uh, say, yeah, because when I first read that, I was thinking, well, I recognise the lions on the on the Trafalgar pillars. Square. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> In my mind, that's Trafalgar Square, but I would like that to be anywhere. Thanks. As for Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia is a whole other story. Um, Mesopotamia is a real place. It's the ancient name of the country we now call Iraq, which is where uh, some of my family originally came from. So um, it's the land between two rivers. That's what Mesopotamia means. I think it's a Latin word. And uh, it's where many things began. Uh, human civilization, writing, agriculture. Uh, so I thought it would be amazing to have Varjak go back to Mesopotamia, like the origin of so many things, to sort of find out what does it really mean to be a cat? Because so many things we think of as being essential to being human actually started in Mesopotamia. So that's why I made him a Mesopotamian blue, and that's why I had him go to Mesopotamia in his dreams. Now, I've never been to Iraq. Uh, my family left there a long, long time ago. It's something I've heard many stories about. I've seen many pictures of. So to me, it has an almost mythical quality. And I suppose what I did with Mesopotamia in the book kind of mirrors my own experience. Varjak hears about Mesopotamia, um, but then he goes there in his dreams. So I don't know. For me, that that feels powerful and, and meaningful. So oh, it is. I hope, it, is, I hope yeah. it works but for you. It's, it's really, really powerful. And then, I mean, my, my heritage is all uh, based in the, the highlands of Wales, uh, oh, wow. right in the in north of Wales is Snowdonia. So now that, you know, Jalal's up a mountain and talking about mountains and things, I'm there, I'm, <laughs> I'm in it, yeah. <laughs> um, so th thank you so much again for allowing me or giving me permission to read your book out loud. Um, I absolutely love doing it. Um, do you, what do you think about, um, do you think it's always best for someone to read the book themselves? Uh, or do you think there's any merit in being read to and, and hearing someone else's sort of interpretation of voices and things like that? Yeah, well, I think there's huge merit in it, absolutely. I mean, there are so many different ways that you can access a book. Um, I don't think you should rule any of them out. Uh, you know, whatever helps you get into it is fine by me, really. So, no, I, I, I love it when people read my books aloud. I think it's brilliant, you know. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And since Valjat Poor was published, I've been lucky enough that quite a lot of teachers have, have read it and I've been lucky enough to hear some of them do it. And uh, frankly, they do it much better than I do. You do it <laughs> way better than I do. So uh, <laughs> I, 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 think it's a, I think it's a brilliant thing. Having said that, um, you know, I think it's also a brilliant thing to lose yourself on your own in a book because then the experience is really unique to you. So I think all the all of this, these things are good. Um, and if someone has enjoyed hearing a story aloud, maybe they might then want to try and read it for themselves and see how that might change it. Um, but, you know, uh, reading aloud is so crucial. I mean, my first memory of anything ever in the world is of my uncle uh, reading me a book aloud. I was about three years old. Um, this is the book, The Cat in the Hat. Ah, of course. <laughs> Dr. Seuss. I thought it was amazing, you know, so I was very lucky uh, as a child, many adults took the time to read to me and created a lifelong love of reading and books. When I um, met the cat in the hat, it feels like I actually met the cat in the hat. I just thought it's amazing. I want the cat to come to my house, smash everything to bits. It would be brilliant, <laughs> you know, and this was a kind of play that my uncle and I shared together. You know, he was only 10 years older than me. He was like 13 or something. Seemed like a grown up to me at the time. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that connection, sharing, is, is really, really strong and powerful. So uh, I think it's brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Again. Oh, thank you. Um, well, it's funny because when I first read the book, I read it to my own children and um, they've always known me to do funny accents and funny voices and things like that. And I allowed them to choose. So I would, whenever a new character came on, I would say, right, there's a new character here. This is what they look like. What do you think they might sound like? And and, and I try and match the voice to what they said. So it's funny, all of my accents that have come from 
uh, you know, that I read aloud uh, each week have come from my children's suggestions, which is quite funny. Um, do you, have you heard any of the accents that I've given the characters? Do you think they match or? I've heard some of them, yeah. Um, so what I would say uh, about voices is exactly the same as I would say about places, uh, which is whatever I imagine in my mind doesn't really matter, actually. Uh, in a sense, a writer is just creating something for somebody else to bring to life. Whether you do that in your own head or you do it by reading it aloud, somebody else is always making a book come to life. And unless they do that, it's nothing, is it? It's just ink and paper. So, um, so yeah, I, I think everyone is free to imagine whatever voices they want. Really? Uh, you know, so for example, uh, even though you might find this really surprising, uh, given the names, I never imagined Omar and Ozzy as Australian. Oh, um, right. No, never. Uh, uh, but I suddenly, oh, Ozzy, of course. <laughs> so, so I love your voices for Omar and Ozzy. I think they're, they're epic, you know, but they're absolutely, absolutely not what I imagined. But what I imagined doesn't matter. That's the point. It's even the same with the illustrations. You know, I think Dave McKean, absolute genius, yeah. my favourite artist in the whole, whole world, mm. draws the best cats I have ever seen, the best dreams as well. Yeah. Um, none of that is like I imagine it. It's better though, that's the yeah. thing. Dave draws the stuff better than it is in my mind. And I, I honestly believe teachers such as yourself bring it to life better than it sounds in my mind. Oh, really? But if I can have the words on the page that let you guys do that, then I've done my job, I think. Brilliant, oh yeah, absolutely. And thank you for, for, um, for recognizing that it was Australian because I, <laughs> I do usually do quite a bad job of those ones. Um, but no, no, I, no, no, it was fantastic, <laughs> I could really. <laughs> I totally agree with you about um, Dave McKean's illustrations, though, because I mean, one of the big things, because um, when I when I uh, teach this in school, we do a lot on the artwork and we copy the artwork. We do stuff in the style of the artwork and you can end up with some tremendous and it really does tap into the children's imagination. So I totally, you know, I'm really chuffed that you got Dave on board for that. It's brilliant. I mean, I, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, he was one of my heroes. I sort of read the comics he was doing in the 1990s as a fan uh, and when my publisher the brilliant David Pickling uh, said okay uh, you've now finished the 17th draft of Varjack Paul very good um, who do you think draws cats well and I was like oh Dave McKean is the best you know but he won't want to do my book you know I'm nobody but he said no no we will send it to him and the worst that can happen is he says no so uh, he sent it to Dave Dave read it with his daughter who was at school at the time and with their cat who by complete coincidence was a silver blue cat with amber eyes oh, what are wow. the anyway apparently they all liked it so he got in touch and said yes I would love to draw some cats for you so <laughs> I just I just gave him the words uh, and it, you know, it came back looking like that. You know, this whole idea that uh, in the real world, the illustrations would be one style, but then in the dreams, suddenly they would be everywhere. They would be behind and throughout. This was all, and then back in the real world, the text and the picture separate. That was entirely Dave. I can take no credit at all for that. Um, Genius. So, you know, we just gave him the words and it came back yeah. <laughs> looking yeah. like, more like a that uh, that is, that my is genius thing. that really <laughs> yeah brings the fear into you doesn't it with it getting closer and then there you are that's you yeah tiny kid underneath <laughs> it. i mean that's amazing so you know i'm very right. very very lucky to work with somebody as brilliant as that amazing well that leads me on nicely to ask you probably the the big question the one question that everyone wants to know is there ever going to be a Varjak Poor movie or cartoon? We've been working on trying to make that happen since the book was published. Okay. We've many, many adventures uh, in Hollywood and elsewhere. Um, not yet, but okay. I hope it will happen one day. You know, we're still trying. Um, Dave and I are currently working with a producer who actually uh, read the book to his kids uh, and, uh, you know, fell in love with it like that. So we're, we're trying. It's, it's really tough. Well, to that get... would be, yeah, that would be amazing if that happened. It would be brilliant, but it's really tough to get these things made because they are expensive, you know. Yeah. Uh, movies, even TV adaptations, they cost a lot of money. Um, we were told when we were trying to make a, a Varjak Paul feature film that we would need about $10 million. 
So if anybody watching this has $10 million, please get in touch. Uh, we can find a great use for it. Uh, but, you know, in, in the meantime, you know, we're, we're doing our best, but it's made me realize I can't get films made, but what I can do is, is write books because actually books don't cost that much. Whether it's like Varjak Poor and it's just cats in yeah. a city, or it's a giant space epic like Phoenix, which crosses an entire galaxy and there are ancient gods and it's, you know, the end of all worlds and this kind of thing. I think maybe that would cost a hundred million to do as a movie, yeah. but as a book, it's just ink and paper. So really? I can have the biggest ideas I want in a book. No one is ever going to say there's a problem with the budget, mate. Um, you know, so I, I feel very lucky that the main thing I do is, is try and make great books. Well, people uh, always say, don't they, that the book is always better than the film or, you know, because <laughs> you've got the, your own imagination and your own pictures of what it could look like. So I think it's more personal to you, right? It's more mm. democratic. There are, there are very, very few adaptations I've seen that I feel are possibly better. One, only one I can really think of, which is the Lord of the Rings films. Mm. Um, absolutely not the Hobbit films, but the Lord of the Rings films. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord of the Rings films, I think, are fantastic. I yeah. mean, they are, they are really, really great, 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 great. So when, when you're old enough, kids... <laughs> watch watch those ones um and just on just on the movie thing because my kids really really wanted to to uh say this they said if a if a movie is going to be made about varjak poor please can our daddy do one of the voices so i'm just uh putting it out there right now <laughs> it's on the record <laughs> yes brilliant um so which which character let's go back to varjak uh varjak poor both of those books though which characters do you um, would, would you say you are most like in the book? Does anyone sort of have any of your personality or your traits that sort of come out in that at all, do you think? It's interesting. I mean, I think the truth is for a writer, all the characters probably reflect something in you. Uh, even the evil ones, maybe, even especially <laughs> the evil ones. Uh, so um, so I, I, I find that really hard to answer, but I would, I would ask you the same question. What do you feel? Are there any characters who you feel particularly connected to? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, I would have to go with probably Elder Poor um, because I I love passing on knowledge and information to the younger ones. And and also Elder Poor only knew three of the, uh, the secret ways and my memory is <laughs> terrible as well. So I'd probably only end up knowing that much too. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, right. brilliant. Um, and I've got to ask you this, what, uh, I mean, I've definitely got a favourite moment in uh, the, let's talk about the first book, because we don't want to ruin the, the surprise for the for the outlaw, because we haven't finished reading that yet. So in the first book, Varjak Paul, what's your favourite moment in there? Because when I've read it to children and to classes, there are definitely moments where people are out of their seats, they're cheering, or they're just sat there sobbing or clapping, you know, what what's, what's a standout moment for you? Well... I, I'm kind of imagining or guessing what the sort of moments are that you're talking about, and they definitely mean a lot to me as well. Uh, but I don't want to spoiler it for people who've who've, who've not read them yet. Sure. Um, there's a there's a, a less sort of big moment maybe that that means an awful lot to me, uh, and that is what what happens with these two black cats. In that there's a fight at the end with the two black cats. I remember. Now, yeah. these, these two black cats are, they are probably my favorite thing in the whole of Varjak Paul, um, because they did not exist until, so, I think something like the 15th draft. Really? Certainly, yeah, the final year of writing. Uh, and they are there in chapter one. Uh, and people who've read the book sometimes don't believe I could have written it without the two black cats because they kind of get the thing going. Yeah. But I think Writing is mysterious. Sometimes you only know the beginning when you know everything else that's going to follow it. Uh, and so those two black hats really appeared very, very late in the process. And then when I kind of realized what was going to happen to them in the end, um, I, 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 I think that's my favorite thing in the book. May, maybe because it reminds me that writing is mysterious and it can take a long, long time. And sometimes you might want to give up. You know, there were times you know, I worked on this book for five years of my life. That is a long time to spend on one story. And there were times I thought, oh, 
cats. Never going to happen. I should just give up. But the black cats remind me, if you persevere, you might find something great that just pulls it all together, as I feel they do. Uh, so with each book that I've written since, there's always been something that comes along very, very late. And I think, ah, this is like the two black cats. Uh, it's my reward for hanging in there and persevering, keeping going. So I think whatever you want to do, always persevere. Hang in there. Don't give up. Keep trying to get better. You will get there in the end. Right. And the two black cats kind of remind me of that in my own writing. Well, yeah, they are definitely an integral part of that of that scene at the end. And you, you feel that it's that it's ridiculous that, you know, that they're never going to be um overpowered they're not going to be overcome and then you know there's that secret so yeah that's that's absolutely brilliant five years and i mean it for all of us it is well worth it and we're really glad that you didn't give up and you spent that time on the book oh that is really nice to hear i mean the the bad news is uh, phoenix took me seven years <laughs> so even worse and but I, I thought nothing would ever be that bad again but the new book that i've been working on uh which is called tiger uh but with a y t-y-g-e-r um, inspired by uh, William Blake, an amazing poet who wrote a poem called The Tiger, mm -hmm. uh, and also writers like Philip Pullman, Mallory Blackman, some of my favourite writers. Mm -hmm. I've been working on Tiger now for eight years, wow. so I seem to be getting slower and slower yeah. each time. Um, <laughs> but I think I'm getting more ambitious too. I think each book is, is a little bit bigger. I mean, I wouldn't change anything in Varjapur, uh, but actually I think The Outlaw is a better written book. I really do. I've reread them both quite recently and I think it's better. And Phoenix is, is a much bigger, you can just see yeah. how much more ambitious. Varjak is a kitten in the back streets and alleys of one city. Phoenix is an entire galaxy. This book contains stars, supernovas, black holes, ancient gods. You know, it's the biggest stuff I can imagine. And Tiger, even bigger than that. Wow. Tiger. So, yes, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> The ambition gets bigger, so the books take longer. That's do, the do you, do you write books simultaneously, or do you have to be done with one book before you can start writing the next? That's a fantastic question. Uh, different writers work differently. Um, personally, I like to be done with one book before starting on the next, but Tiger has actually uh, blindsided me. So I started out eight years ago writing a book called Tiger. After two and a half years, I thought, this is book two in a sequence of books. I had to put aside two and a half years of work and write book one. So always in the back of my mind as I've been working on book one is book two that I want to come back to when book one is finished. So I am kind of writing two books at the same time now. Sure. I wouldn't choose to do that and I wouldn't <laughs> recommend it either. But, uh, you know, normally I like to do one thing at a time. I'm very sort of single track focus kind of writer but uh, everybody is different and there are people who like to have loads of different projects there are no rules in writing whatever works for you whatever helps you do your best work is correct that that is the only rule that there is and do you think there will be another in the Varjak Poor series oh yes very much so I'm totally planning to write a third book about Varjak one day however no. that day will not be very very soon and sure. here is the reason. So in the first book, Varjak is a kitten, very, very young character learning the secret martial art from some very old cats like uh, yourself, the elder Paul, uh, <laughs> and uh, Jalal, of course. OK, in the second book, uh, Varjak has really grown up. He's an adult cat now and his problems out there in the world are very adult kinds of problems, I think. So it makes sense to me then in a, a third book, it'll come full circle. Varjak is now a very old cat himself. And he is trying to pass on everything that he has learned in his life. So he's maybe as old as the elder Paul or Jalal. And he's trying to teach perhaps some kittens everything that he knows about the way. That's kind of my idea for what happens in the third book. Um, the only thing is, although I, I have been very young, uh, I am currently an adult. Uh, I haven't yet been old. I, I am getting there much quicker than I ever thought possible, but I don't quite feel <laughs> old enough yet to really write a book about an old character. And I don't think maybe you should until you know what it's really like. So I'm keeping notes. Uh, I absolutely am planning to do it one day. So please be patient if you love our Jack Paul and you would like a third one. It will happen one day. In the meantime, if you want more, you should totally write yourself wow. about your story. Why not? I would be There's honored. 
I think that'd be amazing. You know, some yeah. of the first stories I ever wrote were inspired by my favorite movies and TV and comics and books. You know, and you're totally allowed to do that, uh, as far as I'm concerned. If you want to write, um, for example, a story about one of the other characters in Varjak Paul, from their point of view, you could do that. If you want to write a story about something before Varjak Paul, maybe Jalal when he was younger, or maybe after the end of the outlaw Varjak Paul, what happens to Jess as she grows up? You can totally do that. Um, and I, as I say, I would be honored and thrilled if you want to read more of any of my books, um, write them yourselves. I think that would be amazing. fantastic. What a, what a challenge. That's that's really good. I might, I might even take you up on that and do a bit of a short story at some point. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, and, you know, it, it might be that by the time Varjak 3 comes out, that our listeners now, they might be teachers and reading them to their classes. They might be parents reading them to their kids. Wow, imagine that. Um, that's, that's incredible. And, and thank you so much for, for sharing with us about your new project, Tiger, as well. So you've been working on it a long time. Do you have a, a sort of a rough end date for that when it's going to come out or no, not yet? The only thing I know is that it takes as long as it takes to make a book as good as you possibly can. And that is my ambition with every book. I want it to be the very, very best it can possibly be, however long that might take, however tough that might get. So, you know, uh, and my editor believes that even more strongly than I do. Uh, <laughs> you know, he's a, he's a fantastic editor. He's edited some of my own favorite writers. And his, his rule really is you've got to keep going because once a book is published, you can't change it. Yeah. That is it. So you never want to look at a book and think, oh, no, I wish I'd done something different there. Uh, the great thing, although I complain a lot about how long it takes me to write each book, is that when I look at my books now, I, I genuinely don't see anything that I would change. Brilliant. They are as good as I could make them. I went as far as I possibly, possibly could. And that is a really nice thing to feel about your work. That OK, that was hard. That is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. But it really is the very best I can make them. I would love to, I would love to write hundreds of books because I have hundreds of ideas. I know that's never going to happen. Uh, if I'm taking five, seven, eight years a book, you know, I might only ever write a few, but I can make each one the very best I can possibly do. And then whoever you are, whatever you like or think you like, you will find something to enjoy in one of my books. That's that's my ambition now. It's, it's quality rather than quantity. Well, we do. We really enjoy your books. And, you know, we can tell that the effort that you've put into them. I mean, I would go as far as to say as the Varjak Paul books are my favourite books of all time. I, I don't know. I, I can completely say that hand on heart. And when I read them, I don't know if you can see in the video, sometimes I've got tears in my eyes, my voice chokes up, I just get so passionate. And I'll tell you what it is for me. It's the, the friendship. It's the way they stick together as friends, you know, Holly, Tam, Varjak, they've been through it and you feel that you've been through it all with them. And so when they say something like, let's do this together or no one gets left behind, so it totally chokes me up and I'm like, this is, this is real life, you know. Well, thank you. When I, when I hear things like that, it, it makes all the hard work worthwhile. So anyone who's enjoyed one of my books, you know, uh, that makes the work worthwhile you know that's Brilliant. why we do it that's the, that's the oh, whole point absolutely no that's amazing thank you and um, so before we go again a massive thank you for a writing the books and b allowing us to to share them and c for coming and, and talking to us as well so all these fantastic kids who are listening um that you know and and all the shout outs that i'm doing it's absolutely lovely to have you here so one last tip then because we're in lockdown at the moment. We're not sure how long it's going to go on for. We've obviously been through one already. Um, and, you know, do you have any tips to, to children who are at home, children who are sort of in their lockdown, not being able to see their mates or anything like that? Do you have any tips that you could give them that may have helped you at all? Well, you know what? I remember um, during the first lockdown, um, it, it was really, really difficult and stressful, but... I remember there was one day I just picked up a, a book um, by a writer I really love and I just started reading it and almost immediately I forgot coronavirus, I forgot lockdown, I forgot everything and I was just in the world of this book and it was brilliant uh, and the just the pleasure 
that you can get from reading a story you love um, or really doing anything that you love, you know, um, it, it's, it is so powerful and it's transformative, you know. So I think if you're having a hard time, you know, it's, it's really, really important to do things for you, things um, that aren't necessarily about working hard or, you know, doing what other people want you to do stuff you really want to do so wh whatever you love you know do that um i have to admit i i read as many comics as i read novels so uh in lockdown two i've really been reading a lot of comics <laughs> and um and i love it it's brilliant uh there's nothing better than losing yourself in the pages of a beautiful comic you know with amazing worlds and characters and so you know music as well has been quite quite big for me in the past few months I've discovered some amazing new music so you know follow the things you love whatever they are whatever they might be and, and, and just just do it for you you know just do it for fun reading for pleasure is is the best thing I think you can possibly do right now and if you want to take it one step further try writing for pleasure don't worry about is this any good Will anyone else ever read it? Will Mr. Wickens give it a good mark? You know, no, don't worry about that. Just write a story you genuinely would like to read yourself and enjoy it. You know, try and imagine maybe it's a movie you're watching and you're writing down what happens on the screen. Just have fun. And I think that can be incredibly powerful um, and can really, really help at times like this, but actually at all times, you know, um, yeah, yeah. Do, doing the things you love. I think that's really, really important thing to do. So, um, so thank you for all your fantastic questions. And as I say, for, for reading uh, the, the book aloud, I should say, of course, that um, the permissions ultimately really are the publishers to give more than the writers. My publishers have been sort of very generous, like I think all publishers at the moment, and have just given permission to everybody. Um, but I do like encouraging people to do this because I think it's fantastic. I think it's the sharing of the love of stories, inspiring a love of stories is, is, a, is a brilliant thing to do. So thank you again, Mr. Wickens and, and to all your viewers, uh, happy reading. It's, uh, oh, yes. Thank you. That's absolutely amazing. And that's really sound advice about doing the thing you love as well to, to do, so do it for you and make you happy. So thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat to us. I really appreciate it. And so does everybody else. And we'll keep, we'll keep doing the shout outs and I'll keep tweeting and including you in there so you can see how we're getting on. But thank you very, very much. Keep the way alive. Keep the way alive. Thank you.